Now, you see it sometimes, you see the funk. Nobody would expect to learn as much as we did in seven days. Six kids from different backgrounds got together to help tell the story of funk. We wanted to learn how identity, history, culture, and the community tied together in Omaha's funk scene. To gain background knowledge, we spent five days researching and analyzing artifacts. We conducted four interviews that helped set the tone of funk. We explored three local hotspots that brought the community together through the love of funk. To tie it all together, we edited our documentary in two days to tell one story. My name is Juan Lively. My name is Ron Cooley. I am Rayford Jones. My name is Robert Holmes Sr. Funk scene for me <clears throat> was going strong in the late 60s through the 70s. And by the way, funk came from church. That's where it all started at. Because they kick it. They kick it. Preacher said, yeah, Lord, he'd be jumping on around. Oh, my God, oh, you know. It was real, a spiritual thing with them. It was deeper than just the outside of it. Classical music, we put that in there, too. Hispanic music, oh, Jamaican music, African music. Oh, they're kicking, too. You know, there are all different flavors of it, of funk music. And then, this, then next you know, you develop a funk sound like Prince did. And that's the other thing about funk music with these musicians. They they were the right, I can name the Commodores and uh, you know, Parliament Funkadelic, all of these groups, they all meshed real good together with each other. The jazz at that time really is what evolved into mm -hmm. some funk music too. You had your funk bass, but you had those beautiful strings and horns, you know, yeah. just accenting. The funk is something that is strong. It hits you. It just takes me somewhere. You know, certain sounds like the strings. Mm -hmm. I, I love, my favorite is the horns. The funk has to be a driving force in your soul. You know, you look at Jim and Jam and uh, Jerome at the time band. They live right down the 24th from Hamilton. You know, that's Prince in them. Yeah, they're from Omaha. You look at Buddy Miles, play with Jimmy Hendrix. Right there in Omaha, right there in North Omaha. We had a lot of great people came, did a lot of great things on the outside. How did I get into it? The James Brown influence, Sly and the Family Stone. Uh, if, it, if it had a, a nice, Bottom and back beat, that, that was my thing. My history would be with a couple of bands uh, that were early kind of funk bands in Omaha. The first one would be the Les Smith Soul Band. Our first job was at a North High School sock hop at the Old North Branch YMCA. Chuck Miller was the one who put all the black bands together in Omaha. He was the he was the maestro, he was the king. And uh, did it at a boys club down here on, on 20th Street, 20th and Grace. 16th and Capitol, down by where the Civic Auditorium used to be, right in that area. There used to be a club down there called the Music Box, which was a bowling alley concert hall. And uh, we played there a few times, sponsored our own concerts and played there. What I remember is playing at uh, Sandy's Escape, it was a teen club. There was a place called Allen's Showcase. I mean, you you look forward to performing there. Small place, small stage, but you can pack a few guys on there and, and just, just jam the night out. ETC came out here. They went past 72nd Street. Playing the club right down the street, the 20s. 82nd, 84th and Center. Uh, the Mickey's Club. The ranch bowl, they called them the N-word. Got the skirts. Didn't stop us. I know we played a place called Fickies, which is on 90th and Emmett. Um, that was, that place drew 
everybody. Ozone is good. Um, uh, the Aquarius, which was at 70, I want to say 72nd and Pacific. It was a, a kind of a roundish building. In the 70s era, mm -hmm. when funk music was really on a rise, it was a lot of crazy costumes. We came out there with capes, everything, oh yeah, chain across the chest. Bell bottoms up. Psychedelic was all different colors in those pants. Green, red, white, yellow. That was a real big thing back then, too. Leslie and Arno both had green Edwardian suits. The platform shoes that they wore. Men, even men wore like high heel shoes and, and all that kind of stuff they wore back then. The rest of the band, we had kind of a checked suit. Shoes, my shoes, I have fur boots this big. We had gaudy red couplings. Yeah, costume was a real big thing because oh, yeah. the funk music, it was not only your sound, it was also a visual thing. A female singer? That's changing the game. Is she good? Good? Oh, Lord. It's like listen to your grandmother in the, in the kitchen singing, and she can sing. Your mama sits in the kitchen, she can sing. Because when she opens her mouth, you have no choice but to listen. But Square Biz was the band. We can play anything. We can play some rock band, tore it up. We can play some Mexican music, tore it up. And put the funk to it. Now that, it wasn't ready for. The Destiny was an all girls group. Everybody knew each other. Everybody helped each other out. And uh, we did. There was a, um, a gal who played guitar in North Omaha named uh, Lois. She was inducted into the uh, uh, Omaha Black Music Hall of Fame at the same time that Ellie Carnival was. I have a cousin, because she was in a funk band and she played the trumpet with a funk band. And where did she get that from? Who influenced her with that? Sly and the Family Stones. As a female, she's a female vocalist, and she plays trumpet. And that made my cousin inspire her to do that. Funk music, I think in the 70s, was mainly liked by, it was African American crowd. But as a group, white people, um, Hispanic, just all different races were gravitated to that kind of music in that era. We were the first band in Omaha that had a mixture of different uh, ethnicities in the band. You saw people that normally don't come together with each other, that music brought a lot of people together from different races. We were playing at the time of the Vietnam War. And it was at the time when it was at its worst point. And everyone knew that we couldn't win the war. We had everything in the world to stop us. I ain't gonna lie to you. We couldn't go past 72nd Street. Seriously. 72nd Street was the boundary line between West Omaha and North Omaha. Um, we broke that when ETC came out here. Broke that, it was the first one out here. It went past 72nd Street. We concentrated on dance music, especially when we were uh, the LA Carnival. Dance music and music about people getting along and freedom. As the social uh, climate changed in the late 60s. James Brown started having, you know, uh, you know, I'm black and I'm proud. And we played songs like that. As the nation became more aware, all of the artists became more into that. It was a time that EDC was playing at the uh, the Air Force Base, and uh, they came in with a drill tactic, come with guns at their heads and everything, trying to scare us off. 
At the time we, we played, uh, one of our songs was We Need Peace and Love. Uh, we had I Am Of One Color. We had I'd Like To Pose A Question, which was Can We All Live Together. Those were the kind of the themes that we dealt with in some of our music. And it was a commentary on what, you know, America was supposed to be. They tried, they, they tried everything. They didn't want to be scared of us because they know where the music is coming from. They're not stupid. So they said, no, we can't have this out here, you know? Were you playing at, at a club out west and um, the owner may not like some of the clientele coming in. Um, you get a little pushback from things like that. And you know what? You know what's behind it. There were some people that didn't like the fact that we were playing in certain places. They're like, they want to stop us. They want to stop us. They did everything they can. Back in the 70s, or I would even say in the 80s, where you go through certain towns and they don't like to see you coming. Not even to stop off to use the bathroom or anything like that. We played at Sandy's Escape. They had an upstairs and a downstairs. We played upstairs the first two or three times we played there. Uh, then Sandy said, well, I'll have you guys play downstairs tonight. And, you know, we'll let you play downstairs and see how it goes. So we went downstairs and there were some tough guys from another high school that didn't like the fact that Leslie, our lead singer, was there. And they were flicking matches at it, mighty matches flicking at that stage. So we didn't ever play downstairs again. This was in the 90s. White people were on, the, on this side. Black people were on the other side. And I said, is this 1955? What is this? And, uh, so I'm doing the R&B funk songs that we're talking about, and a lot of them don't know those songs, they're not because they didn't come up hearing that kind of stuff, didn't want to hear that kind of stuff. And then I think I did, the song I did was Shout. You know you made me wanna shout, kick my heels up and shout, throw my hands up and shout, throw my hands back and shout. And when I did that, both sides got up and started dancing in the middle of the floor. Well, funk music and R&B are intertwined. Mm -hmm. They're one and the same. Funk music is just another form of R&B music. They described us as the missing link from Sly and the Family Stone to hip hop. And even to this day, funk music is in some kind of form in every mute, every uh, form of music, even hip hop. Let's take hip hop for instance. They took a lot of James Brown music and sampled it and wrapped on top of it. The funk is something that is strong. It hits you. Slow, you can sing slow, you can sling, sing fast, but the funk has to be a driving force in your soul. I mean, really, poof, poof. See what I'm saying? When we started this project, we had no idea how much we would learn about the history, culture, community, identity, and importance of Omaha's funk scene.